Okay, I want to start on a note of gratitude. And my first thanks is to all of you. Thank you very, very much for inviting me to your church. It's actually my very first time speaking in a church setting. Normally, nikienda kanisani na kwanga nimeka uko. So, um, I'm very grateful that you saw it fit to invite me to your church. And as I was reflecting about coming here, uh, one of the things, because I'm going to share my story with you today, one of the things that I always told myself over the years, throughout my childhood and even as I grew into an adult, one of the things I told myself was that everything that I experienced was not in vain. It was never in vain. There was a reason why God allowed for me to experience all those things. And today I can start to see that reason. The reason that I had to go through all the things that I went through was so that I can minister to other people who might be going through maybe not exactly the same experience as me, but something similar, maybe you're struggling with something in your life. I just want to take this opportunity to tell you that whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you have gone through in the past, it shall come to pass and that there's a purpose for it. There's something that you as a person are supposed to learn from it. And if not you, there's somebody else who's supposed to learn from the things that you have experienced. So do not see it as purposeless. Um, do not see it as things that are just happening to make your life hard, to make you suffer but as things that God is going to use, either to bless you or to bless other people. So I have a projection. I'm going to request that we have the projection up. It will help me think through as, um, as I'm speaking. You know I'm a teacher, and as a teacher, I like to um, have my thoughts organized in a certain way, and the, the slides really help with that. So today I'm going to talk about overcoming personal and family trauma because the kind of trauma that I went through was of a personal nature. It was family trauma and at the end of the day I want to share it from a place of hope um, and also to encourage all of us so that we can also um, feel like there's, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Please go ahead to the next slide. Eh? So in my introduction of myself, um, thank you Mary uh, for, for the introduction that you um, had for me. My name's uh, Dr. Nyaboke Nduati. I'm currently the principal at Nova Pioneer Tattoo Girls. One day I would like to be the CEO. I am not, not yet. <laughs> But Asante Sana for that blessing. Um, I got my PhD in education from Syracuse University. Um, it's a university in New York. So I was there for my master's and also for my PhD. I came back to Kenya in 2016. And uh, since then I've been at Nova Pioneer. During that time I've also published a memoir which um, is just basically my story, um, and it's called No Tears for the Cherished. I like that Mary said um, that sometimes there are tears, and tears are very good. Um, the reason that I named my book No Tears for the Cherished is because the No Tears part was a coping mechanism that I developed as a child. Um, because as a child, there was so much happening around me. There was so much sickness. There was so much violence that um, I felt like I had to protect myself in one way or the other. And the way that I protected myself during that period in my life as a child was to kind of like build a wall around myself. It's not advisable. It's not the best thing to do. 
but it was the way that I protected myself as a child. I built some very strong walls around myself. I was very numb to everything that was happening around me, and I was really trying to survive. I was in survival mode. If you've ever heard of survival mode, that is the mode that I was in for very, very many years in my life. Um, those are some of my pictures from that period in my life. Um, the middle picture, I don't have very many pictures from my, my childhood, um, but that middle one, I sometimes call it my chokorafes because when, when um, both of my parents passed, a lot of our relatives um, had a lot to say to us. And one of the things that they kept telling us was that we will become chokoras. Um, and so that was kind of like, in quotes, in quotes my chokora phase. The other two on, I believe that's your right, that's my, my mom and my siblings. I kind of blurred out other people's faces, my siblings, because um, just to respect their privacy. And this is me as a teenager, also just still trying to survive. On the next slide, you'll see me now, and I thank God that I was able to come. See, we appreciate God for yeah, getting, us, <laughs> getting us out of that. Um, so that is me now, uh, myself and my husband. My husband really wanted to be here today, but my children were reporting back to school, so he wasn't able to come because he had to take the, the, the boys to school. My daughter is actually here. Um, she's called Imani. I asked if she can come say hi, and she said, Mom, no, 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 please don't call me, but she's right there. Um, her name is Imani. I also came with two of my colleagues. We have Miss Juliet, who is um, one of the, of the dorm mothers who takes care of the girls at the school where I am. Um, she also ministers in, in for, um, for us sometimes to, to our girls. So I got a lot of inspiration from her. I was asking her, hey, <laughs> and she told me, just do whatever the spirit leads you, you will be fine. Um, I also came with my other colleague, Miss Belinda. She's a chemistry teacher. I'm a SOMA science sana. Um, she does a very great job with uh, our students. Oh, and my other colleague also, Miss Roslyn. She's an English teacher. We appreciate you for being here today. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, that is my, my book that I wrote. Um, and I'm hoping that all of us will take the opportunity to get a copy and read it. It's actually a book that can be a blessing to you if you're a young person. It can also be a blessing to you as an adult, as a mom, as a dad, because it really um, gives you that pause to think about the relationship that you have with your child and um, just the interactions. You know, one of the questions that you ask yourself at the end of, um, after reading this book is, how is it that I am relating with my child? If my child was to write a book about me today, what would they write? So um, I welcome you to get a copy for yourself. Um, you'll get a, a, a more in-depth um, you'll get the story more in depth from the book than you might from me today. Um, so we can move to the next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a little, a little bit of time talking about my journey. And then after I talk about my journey, I'm going to talk about some of the ways that I coped. I have to say that I'm not a trained counselor but I've gone through a lot of counseling and um, I've learned quite a lot in my journey of healing. 
And I cannot say that I am completely healed, but I have walked quite a long journey when it comes to working on myself, working on my healing, and I would like to share some of the things that I've learned along the way with you. So, the trauma part. The trauma um, started from as far back as I can remember. Actually, my very first memory of myself being alive is um, the memory of domestic violence in, in our home. My father was um, a businessman. He worked for the government, but then quit that to start his own business. And he was a very, very successful big businessman for that time. This was in the early 90s. So being a successful businessman, um, there was a way that he carried himself. Um, and I, when I reflect back on my father and his life, I think a lot of the things that he was struggling with were also generational because he had come from a very poor background and had been able to make um, quite some success for himself. But he was still carrying a lot of those um, generational traumas that he had also experienced. Um, so my father was a violent man. If, um, for lack of a better word, he was a violent man and my earliest memory is of myself and my siblings just sitting around the dinner table. Um, and I could sense, even at that age, I must have been maybe three or four years old, but I could sense some tension in the house. I could sense that something was wrong. Because my mother was very uneasy, she had a young one, there's a younger brother, so my brother must have been maybe two years old. She was trying to feed my brother, at the same time she's trying to attend to my dad. My dad was shouting from the room, calling her every other minute. So she was, you know, shuffling between the dinner table and the bedroom, dinner table and bedroom. And during one of those trips when she went into the bedroom, we just heard like, you know, those loud sounds, like something like that. And even at that age, I knew what was happening. So myself and my siblings, we quickly got out of the dinner table, ran into the bedroom, and locked ourselves in there. And from there, we could hear everything that was happening in my parents' room. My, my mother was being beaten with everything and anything. There were some small stools in that room, and even, even from my room, I could tell she was being beaten with furniture. It wasn't even hands. It was, she was being beaten with furniture. And my mom was screaming and screaming and screaming until it came to a point where she wasn't screaming anymore. She was quiet. So everything just went dead quiet for some time. And in my mind, I thought she was already dead. Um, and I was just sitting in that room together with my two brothers. The older siblings were in boarding school, so they were not home. And as we were sitting there, we just heard my dad shouting, come here. So he was calling us. And we had him dragging, you know, you could just hear something being dragged on the floor. So we came from the room, came into the living room where my dad was. He had dragged my mom into the sitting room. She was unconscious. There was a lot of blood all over her on the floor. She looked like she was dead. Um, and what my dad told us is that, come here, look at your mother for the last time because I'm going to kill her today. You're never going to see her again. So my brothers and I, we stood there, looked at our mom, um, and then he told us to go away. So we went back into the bedroom and we, had, we could hear him dragging her back. He dragged her back into the bedroom and because she was unconscious, he, he wasn't beating her anymore. Things were just quiet. So I don't know, maybe he was waiting for her to wake up so that he could continue. But things were quiet for a few minutes. And then suddenly we just had someone getting up and running and, and, and you know, like um, banging the door. 
So luckily my mother was able to escape that night. And um, so we slept in the house because of course as a child being, my brother was two years old, I was three or four, there's nowhere you can go. So we stayed in the house, we slept. The next morning, my dad woke us up, got us ready for school, and it was like business as usual. It was like nothing happened. And when we came back from school in the evening, my mother was back. She had all these bruises all over. She was swollen all over. Um, but she was back in the house. And she was behaving like the good wife that she was, just, you know, continuing to cook for him. And my, my father used to smoke a lot. So my father was just sitting, you know, the way they sit like that. Eh? And he was smoking his cigarettes. My mom was hustling up and down. Um, so that is one memory that stuck with me for very, very many years. I mean, up to today. It's one of the things that really stuck in my head. And as parents, um, we have children. And sometimes we have these arguments with um, our spouses, or sometimes you can even have a fight with your spouse in the house, in the presence of your child, and you think that your child is going to forget. The children never forget. They don't forget. It's something that they will carry for the rest of their lives. So after that incident, um, of course, my mom went back to being a wife, but um, there was a lot of turmoil. I could sense throughout um, that there was always a lot of turmoil in the house. My, my father lived far away, but every time he was home, there was a lot of turmoil. And um, um, one, one, one of the things that my mother used to tell us was about my dad's um, promiscuity. She would always talk, talk to us about my dad's ndogondogos. She would say, oh, baba enu yuko una ndogondogo uko, sijui anafanya nini, anafanya nini. My mom would always tell us all those things. And unfortunately, uh, my mom developed HIV and AIDS. She got very sick, and she didn't know. She didn't, she didn't, actually up until her death, my mom did not know what she was suffering from. Um, she, of course, I, I, I think it was very prevalent during those times for people to think that it's witchcraft. So my mom thought that she had been bewitched and she created a fear in us about witchcraft. She would always tell us, oh, be very careful. Uh, anytime anybody stepped into our house, we were on edge because we were thinking, oh, this person has come to bewitch us. This person has come to kill us. So we were very socially isolated because we feared everyone. We, um, the fear was coming from, you know, fear of being bewitched, fear of being killed because my mom was deteriorating very fast and it was very clear to a lot of people that she was dying. And of course, for us, we believed that she was being killed. She was not only dying, but she was actually being killed by somebody. We didn't know who that person was, but we believed that somebody was, was killing her. Um, the other reason that we were very socially isolated was because um, of just the amount of uh, sadness that we had in our house. My mother became very depressed. Um, she was, you know, somebody who wakes up in the morning and just sits there. The only time she will interact with us is when she's beating us. She used to beat us a lot. Um, and I don't know, maybe it was because of her relationship with my father. So she would beat us all the time. Um, and if she wasn't beating us, she was just sitting there looking very sad, looking very sick. So as a child, I was very embarrassed. I didn't want any of my friends to come to our house because I didn't want them to see my mom like that. And I also didn't want them to see the state of our house. Our house was always a mess. We were always a mess. Um, we barely ever took showers. We did not have toothbrushes. So like my teeth, you, you'd find a whole layer of food on teeth. You know, you're like removing layers. Because we didn't have toothbrushes, we never used to brush our teeth. We never used to shower. Um, I would get a lot of infections because of, you know, not showering. And also I used to wet my bed 
just because of that stress um, of everything that was going on at home. So eventually my mother passed away. Um, and when my mom passed away, we went to live with my dad. And li life with my dad was very different because my dad had money. The money that he had never used to reach my mom. It was his money. He was living in Kisumu while my mom was living in a different town. So when we moved to live with my dad, it was like we are suddenly rich. You know, we have money. We have all the things we didn't have, toothbrushes, underwears, clothes, all those we had. We had all those. But uh, my father was also very scary. You know, he was, I told you he was dealing with a lot of gener generational trauma um, because he also came from a very violent family, so he was equally violent. Um, not violent, to me he was never violent to me specifically, but I could see the violence with my brothers um, and also just generally the way he behaved. When my, ma when my dad comes into the house, you run, you know, you just run because you never know um, what he can do, what he can do to you. And then um, my dad also started becoming sick because uh, after my mom passed, I think, my dad also, it took him a while to realize what was happening, but he also had HIV and AIDS. So he started getting sick, um, and um, with his sickness came a lot of paranoia. Like he, I think maybe um, sometimes when you get very sick, you start to have hallucinations, you start to become very paranoid. So my dad would see hallucinations he would talk about, like, you know, there are people on the walls who have come for him. You know, he would say a lot of crazy things, things that were not even there. But to him, that is what he could see. And um, he was always very paranoid about being in his room specifically. He said that there were people on the walls and those people had come for him. Um, and then he also became very paranoid with us. He would say that we were stealing from him. Um, actually, one time we all ran away from home because my, my dad became, um, he, 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 he was very suspicious of us. He thought that we are stealing his money, we are stealing my mom's things. I, I don't even know what we were stealing our mom's things for, but he said, oh, your mom's things are disappearing, you're the ones who are taking them, you know. So sometimes he would pretend to go to work, he leaves the compound, and then ananda na pak gari uko inje anarudi, ile pole pole kunyemelea, so that he can find us, you know. <laughs> He's looking to find us um, stealing from him. So um, that was life with my dad, he, because he had HIV and he did find out at some point what he was suffering from, he deteriorated. You know the way HIV can kill, we used to kill people, squeezy, you can live with it, you know, for many, many years. But those days, getting HIV and AIDS was a death sentence. You just waste away within months. So. Around one year after my mom passed, my dad also passed away. And um, his relatives, that was another story. We, before my dad passed, he told us not to trust anyone. And rightly, rightly so, because his, his relatives, you know the way relatives can be. They see it as an opportunity, now we are coming, you know, we are coming. And they are the ones who are telling us, um, and all that. So we, we saw them coming and they came. But um, fortunately, my dad was very smart in many ways. He planned his estate very well before he passed. So when my uncles were coming for those things, they found nothing because everything had already been planned for. So the only thing they could take maybe you take a chair, you take a sufuria, you know, those small, small things, those are the things they could take. And of course, that made them very angry. And that is why they were telling us, oh, you'll be coming to beg us for things. And I thank God that we never did, you know, um, as much as we, 
really struggled, but we never went back to them to beg them for anything. Um, but now, um, so my dad, I said my dad planned his estate, but he planned his estate in such a way that only the boys benefited from it. The girls, uh, and maybe it's a cultural thing, I'm from the Kisi community, the girls were not considered. Nikama, you don't exist, you know. So for us, we didn't feature anywhere. The boys were given, you know, you, you'll take this, you'll take this, you'll take that. And at the time, my brothers were very young. So because they had been left for all these things, Wakaanza kuacha shule, you know, somebody drops out of school, they're like, oh, me, I have money, what am I studying for? They drop out. The other one, you know, they, they just did a lot of things. And within no time, even that money was over. So um, throughout the, my teenage years now, that is when everything started hitting me because when, when my mom was sick when I was a child and when my dad was dying also, that is where there were no tears. I had shielded myself completely. I was just living day by day. I mean, I knew what was happening. I could see that my parents are dying. I could see that, you know, people are saying all these things about us, but it didn't affect me because I had shielded myself in that way. I was just existing. It's like, oh, this person said this, okay. Oh, dad died, okay. Even the day my dad died, I saw people coming, crying. I went to hide in my room. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I just went and sat in my room. I didn't cry, nothing. So when I went to high school, that is where um, all these things started sinking in. And I sank into my own deep, deep depression. Um, in primary school, I was in boarding school as well, and it had started creeping in. But primary school, what was mainly happening was me being in denial, you know. I would lie to people. Nobody in my school knew that my, you know, my parents died. Most people, when they asked me, I'd tell, I'd tell them that, oh, my parents travel a lot. That's why they never come, you know, because nobody ever came to visit me. So I would tell them, oh, they're traveling. Um, and I would make up all these stories about my parents just so that I didn't have to tell anybody that they were dead. Um, so that is how I coped through primary school. Um, and then in high school now, when the depression um, set in, I just, you know, shut down completely. I, I was in one of those schools in, in Nyanza where um, nobody really cared what you were doing, you know. Whether you go to class or you don't go to class, that's your problem, you know. So I would skip my classes and just go sit somewhere. Um, I went to a Catholic school and church was very important. You could miss class, but church, you weren't allowed to miss church. So the reason that anybody paid me any attention was because I started missing church. I could miss classes, nobody cared. But the moment I started missing church, I got called. office principal. Unakalishwa chini. And then now, um, that was the beginning of, of my healing. By then I was like maybe at the end of Form 3 going into Form 4. Um, because when the principal called me, you know, the assembly, and I said, hmm, our principal used to be very funny. I said, there are some people who feel like they are too good to go to church. They feel like, you know, she would talk like that and just say things, things, things. And for that matter, Nyavok and Dwati, and at that time I wasn't using Dwati, and Dwati is my husband's name. Nyavok and Gugu, please come to my office. So everybody in the school knows, you know. Amesha Kwanika, Mbila too. So I went to her office, and... I sat there for a while just waiting for her because she, she wasn't there when I went. So I sat there and she came. When The moment she started talking to me, it's like the floodgates just opened. I had never cried. Up until that point, I had never cried because of my parents. But that was the first time that I remember that I actually allowed my tears to fall. 
and I cried and cried and cried. Pakata principal like a shindra sasata nifanya aje. Aka nituma kwa counselor, uhu enda ungea na counselor. So I went to the counselor um, and I spoke to, to the first counselor I spoke to, we didn't connect, to be very honest. We didn't connect, so nothing happened. And then just by coincidence, I was, I was caught in another issue. And um, fortunately for me, I was caught by another counselor in the school. And um, that was the counselor that really changed my life because the counselor sat me down and really took the time to understand where I was coming from. She didn't focus on my mistake, whatever it is I had done. She focused more on why did I do it, you know. And that is the time when I was able to like really, because even myself, I didn't know why I was doing those things. I just knew that I was this Msumbufu student, but I didn't know why. I just felt like, you know, uh, people, what one and Sumbua things I had, and also nobody ever used to come visit me. At the end of the time, when I gave the report card, nobody used to care at in, when in Ambangapi Amanini. Because at that point, we were living in a house of kids. It was just me and my siblings. We didn't have any adult. Unafanya nini, ama nini. It was just me and my siblings. So, because there was no one who cared, I also didn't care. Because I was like, even if I fail, I'm not failing anyone, you know. Nobody even cares in the first place. And during that time, actually, I also had a lot of, um, I, I don't want to say suicidal thoughts, but I used to sit down and think, if I disappear today, who will even notice? You know, who will even care? Um, so those are thoughts that I actually used to have during those times. But I thank God that after that encounter with our counselor, I was able to um, turn my life around and at least start working hard because um, she helped me understand that, you know, right now you're in a space where you're feeling sorry for yourself. You're wallowing in self-pity. You're acting out because um, of all these things that have happened to you. But at the end of the day, who are you hurting? It's yourself that you're hurting. At the end of the day, it's your life. Um, the same way nobody cares right now is the same way nobody will care when you don't have a job. It's the same way nobody will care when you're in the village and you, you, know, you, you, you have nothing going for you. So this counselor um, really helped me understand that by me starting to work hard, I'm not doing it for anybody. I'm doing it for myself. And I started to really work hard. I was able to pass my Form 4. I went to the university um, and actually for, for the university, you remember those days it was job. Yeah? You, you would be called to a university and um, the government would pay your, your tuition. And because I was an orphan, you know, when you're um, applying for help, if you're an orphan, you get more. So I got the full amount. I had all the money that I needed for my tuition. I had all the money that I needed for my upkeep. So I didn't really need to depend on anyone from the moment that I joined the university. Um, so having shared this story, if we can go back to the slides kindly. So the trauma part, there was a lot of neglect in, in my family. There was physical and sexual abuse. Um, I didn't mention it, but I also underwent sexual abuse actually from the time that I was a, a baby. And the baby part, I didn't even know until very recently. It's my sister who told me because I remember being sexually abused from the time of, from, from around age four um, up until maybe um, age 10, around there. But um, when that was happening, because it was somebody who lived with us in the house, I did not feel like I could tell anyone. Um, because also, when it started, my mom was there. But what was I going to tell her? I just felt like um, it was something shameful 
and my mom was already very violent to us, I felt like if I told her I would be beaten, um, so I never told her. And um, after my mom passed, when we lived with my dad, it also continued even when my dad was there. But even my dad, I couldn't tell him because my dad was very distant. Um, he was also very violent. So I didn't have enough of a connection with either of my parents to be able to talk about being sexually abused. So I would just endure it. You know, I would pretend, actually when it was happening, because somebody would be coming into my room and getting into my bed, um, I would just pretend to be asleep. And um, that is how I coped. I would just pretend like I don't know what's happening, I'm just asleep. And then I would just, you, you know, forget about it and not tell anyone. And I didn't tell anyone until, I told my sister maybe two years ago, my older sister, when I was now planning to publish my book because I didn't want my sister to find out from the book. I wanted her to be well prepared so that when she read the book, she would um, actually have been given some, you know, I, I would have told her the story before telling it to the world. So when I told my sister, um, my sister was not surprised. So what my sister told me was that, oh, actually, the same thing happened when you were a baby. The same person who was abusing me from age four, I, I mean, that's what I can remember. Maybe he was abusing me before that, but I don't have a memory of it. Um, the same person had been caught abusing me as a child when I was like a baby baby. And um, he was beaten and beaten, but, you know, after the beating, he just continued, you know, because his family, you know, that's a family member, where are they going to go? So he continued living in the same house, and um, that is how he continued with that behavior for, until I became old enough that I think now, at that point, maybe he thought, eh, she will tell someone of me. I don't know why he stopped, but he stopped when I was around 10 years old. Um, and then I also went through FGM. I had mentioned that I come from the Kisi community. So FGM, um, the female genital mutilation or circumcision in other words, it's something that is practiced, I think still is in some families is practiced in the Kisi community. And um, when I was young, it had been sold to me as a good thing. You know, my mom used to talk about it and she talked about it with a lot of pride, like that's what makes you a woman. Um, so to me, even when it happened to me, I didn't see it as a bad thing until I was already there and I actually got to experience it. That's where you get the shock like, oh my God, what is happening, what is this? Um, but it had been sold to me as something normal, something good, something that is expected if you're a woman and that's what is going to, you know, get you the respect as a woman. And also we'd been told that if you don't get circumcised, there's no man who will ever marry you, nobody will want you, you know. And they also used to have some derogatory term that they used to use to refer to people who hadn't been circumcised. But when the, when the thing actually happened, um, because you know when my brothers were circumcised, they were taken to hospitals. And they went through you know normal circumcision at the hospital, came home, healed. But when it came to my turn, I, that is what I expected. I expected it was going to be like my brothers. I was going to go to the hospital. It would be like a nice pain, painless thing. Because one of the things that, um, the older women in our family used to pride themselves in, they would say, oh, Mimi at a school year, you know, I was very brave. So I was also looking forward to being brave, to not crying. So when the time actually came and I found myself on the floor, because I wasn't taken to a hospital, I was taken to a slum. You know, zile umnapelekwa kwa vichochoro, mabati mabati, nika unafichua fichua. I was taken to one of those places. Um, and, you know, I was told, take off your clothes, sit on the floor. I sat on the floor, 
and they were using a razor blade. You know, like a razor blade, that, that ka, ka square thing, like, no, rectangular razor blade like that. That thing touches your flesh and you feel like you're, you're dying. You know, I, I could not... Um, I could not believe that that is the thing that had been sold to me over the years. And everybody had always said that I didn't cry. So I felt very ashamed because to me, there was no way I was going to not cry. It touches you like this and you're already dead. You know, you cry and cry until Saudi Naisha. You know, I cried mpaka sijui kama ata ni kufaint, unafaint. Saudi Naisha, you just now become... It's like you're dead, you know. Um, so that happened, and um, by, when it was happening, my mom was already dead. So it's my dad who took me to have that done. Um, and um, it's something that, you know, once it's done, you have to live with it for the rest of, of your life. And uh, it's one of the things that I'm still struggling. I told you I haven't fully healed. I'm still struggling with that part when it comes to forgiveness. Because a big part of um, healing is when you're able to forgive the people that, that um, you interacted with in negative ways. So that's, the, that's one of the things that I still struggle with um, when it comes to forgiveness. When I wrote my book, I wrote it as a letter to my mother. Um, I still feel some distance when it comes to my father, and this is one of the reasons, because I, th there are a lot of things. My mom did a lot of bad things, but my dad did things that, to me, I have continued to struggle with up to today, and that is one of them. Um, so if we can go back to, um, yeah, no, actually the previous one, eh? Yeah, so the sickness, the death, the lack of safety, I've talked about that, and the aftermath, that is now when I was struggling, like in high school, to figure myself out, to just come to terms with everything that had happened, and that is what it looked like. It looked like loneliness, it looked like confusion, depression, desperation, hopelessness, and very low self-esteem. We can now move so how did I get through those times? Um, as much as I was uh, very, uh, in some ways I can say I was problematic when it comes to the way I was behaving in school. I was a bit problematic because I, I wasn't doing anything bad, but I also wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. I wasn't going to class. I wasn't being part of the community, I isolated myself in many ways um, in the school. But um, there are very specific verses in, and, or ch verses in, the, in the Bible that I used to anchor myself on. And um, I told you I went to a Catholic school, so we did a lot of praying. Um, in the Catholic church, the school specifically where I was, we would do prayers every morning, prayers every evening. And it was kind of like just repetitive prayers. You chant and chant, you, you repeat the same prayers over and over and over again. And to me, it was very soothing. These prayers became very soothing for me because I didn't even have to think about what I was saying. Um, and I didn't know how to pray. I knew how to recite the Catholic prayers but I didn't know how to talk directly to God and tell him what I was feeling, what was happening in my life. So I found solace in chanting these Catholic prayers because they were very repetitive. You could, you could just say them. You didn't have to think about it. And then we also had some Catholic songs that um, we would sing over and over again. So some of those songs were based on the... Um, chapters that I had projected. One of them was Psalms, um, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Um, and I actually just anchored on that one verse in that chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And there was a version that I had read which said, um, I have everything that I need. 
So I used to, every time I found myself in a really bad space and I couldn't pray, I couldn't talk to anyone, I would go into the church. Um, we had a very big church within the school compound, so you could go into church anytime you wanted. So when other, when other children are outside playing or just doing other things, I would walk into the church and I would sit at the very back. And I would just repeatedly chant to myself, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. And what that, that um, verse came to mean to me was that I have everything that I need to survive this, you know. Like things may seem very tough right now um, because, you know, life in boarding school was very hard. And it was even harder when you have no one. Other kids, their parents would come during visiting day. They would bring them food. Nobody ever came to visit me in that school. I was always by myself. I didn't have any pocket money. I didn't have any food outside of the normal school food. So I kept telling myself, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. So wherever I am right now, whatever I have right now, I have everything that I need in order to get through this. And that is how I survived my days. Um, the other uh, piece of word that um, I found a lot of solace in was the call of Jeremiah. Um, there was a song that we used to sing about that call of Jeremiah. And I also kept reading that verse over and over again. And I would, you know, like keep thinking about Jeremiah. You know, the Lord said to me, um, the, the way the Lord talked to him and um, told him that he, he knew him before he was formed in his mother's womb and that he selected him, he anointed him to become a, nation, uh, a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah doubted himself and he said, you know, I'm too young, I don't know how to speak. And that is how I felt. I think that is um, the reason that I really connected with that verse because I felt like um, throughout my life I've always felt like there's something bigger than this. Because everything, every evidence that I had in my life pointed towards me amounting to nothing, you know. Everything pointed towards me, my life being meaningless. But deep down, I always felt that there's something greater than this, that this is not all there is. And um, so when I was reading, when I kept reading that call of Jeremiah and... Um, I, I connected with him because I felt like, you know, Lord, what are you calling me for? What do you want me to do? I don't feel like I can do it. I did, you know, similar to De Jeremiah, I didn't know how to speak. I could barely speak in front of two people, let alone a church. And I don't even know how I ended up being a pr school principal because now I speak to, you know, parents, students. I speak in front of crowds. At that time, I could not even talk to someone because I was very shy. Um, I could not articulate my words clearly. Um, so that I, I, I kept feeling, you know, I'm too young. I don't know how to speak. And I kept, you know, telling myself the words that God told Jeremiah that um, do not say that you're too young. Um, you know, whatever it is that I'm calling, to, you, you have to go to the nations, you have to say everything that I command you to say, and do not be afraid of them, because I will be with you, I will protect you. So I kept telling myself that. Um, and then the other book that I connected with was um, the book of Ezekiel, when he talks about the dry bones. So I, I, I also used to read that um, chapter a lot when um, God took Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones and he was asking him, can these bones live again? And um, you know, God told him, prophesy to the wind and you, you know, bring the bones back to life. And at that time, that is what I felt like. I felt like I was those dry bones, like I, there was nothing. 
I felt like I was too broken. I felt like um, there was no way that my heart was ever going to heal. Actually, sometimes I used to think to myself, you know, um, maybe it's better if I start over. You know, can I start my life over? Can I die and just be reborn and start over, have a different life? Um, but the, the book of Ezekiel used to really encourage me because if those dry bones could come back to life, who am I that I can't come back to life, you know, that I can't heal, that I can't bring myself out of this negative space that I am in, in this, in this moment. Um, if you can move. So... Um, like I said, I've talked about, I've done a lot of work on myself to even get to where I am. Um, right now, I have a PhD, people call me doctor, but it's not because I had the money to do any of those things. Actually, it's by grace that I've been able to come as far as I have been able to come. I feel like people have been placed on my path that have helped me along the journey because, like I said, in KU, I got selected through job, um, so the government paid for my tuition in KU when I was doing my undergraduate. Um, then before I even finished my undergraduate, I got a full scholarship to go to the U.S. I, I went to Syracuse University in New York, um, did my master's. Uh, they paid everything for my tuition, my upkeep, and they used to give me a monthly stipend. So I was sorted. Like, I didn't even have to get an extra job because the, the university paid for my upkeep. They paid everything for me. I could go shopping for clothes. I could, I could do whatever I wanted um, because the university, um, in addition to my tuition scholarship, also gave me a very generous um, uh, stipend. So... As I was doing my master's, I also applied into a PhD program within the same university, and I was able to get the same full scholarship with the same kind of uh, stipend, so my PhD was also fully paid for. And that is favor, because I can't say that, um, you know, me, out of all the people in the world, was, I was the most deserving person. But I felt like there was favor in my life because things were just lining themselves up for me. And uh, whenever I needed an opportunity, the opportunity was there, you know. So I'm going to share a few things. I'll try to go through it quickly. I see time in Manda Sana um, about how I think about my own transformation from within. So we can just quickly go through them. Um, developing grit. In order to survive and thrive after trauma, you have to do a lot of um, work in order to develop that emotional grit and resilience because it's very easy to give in and say, you know, I'm just going to accept it, you know, and then you, you just allow your life to go anyhow. So for me, I felt like I had to develop a lot of resilience. And to me, maybe I didn't do it in the best way possible, but um, my way of developing that grit and that resilience was just to become very emotionally removed from everything. That no tears that I was talking about, that, is how, that was my survival mechanism. I was like, oh, this happened, okay. We move. I wasn't crying about anything. I wasn't dwelling on anything negative that was happening in my life. I was just, you know, like acknowledging that this has happened. Okay, let's move on. That is how um, I, I, I um, worked on it. But there are better ways. I'm telling you that is what I did, but there are better ways. Talking to people really helps. I just didn't have anybody that I could talk to. And that is why I protected myself in that way. Um, let's move. So, um, in order to be successful, of course, you know this um, analogy of the iceberg, where what you see at the top is a very small bit of the work that actually goes into getting you to a successful place. 
there'll be a lot of hard work, persistence, you'll get a lot of rejection, you'll have to undergo a lot of um, criticism, you'll doubt yourself, you'll fail, um, but all those things add together as long as you are continuing to push through. Even on the days that are really hard, on the days when you feel like I can't, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. You keep pushing yourself through. When you get criticized, when you get rejected, you keep pushing. And that is when you will be able to achieve that small bit that people see at the top that is called success. Let's move. We can move. Um, so quickly I'll talk about the three rational beliefs at the core of our suffering. And um, these are the things that I, I know, I'm very aware that I do these things. I also have these beliefs, but they're the reason that we suffer. When you hold these beliefs, then you feel like every, everything is unfair in your life. And when you feel like everything is unfair and you allow yourself to feel hopeless and helpless, then it becomes very hard for you to move past the situation that you're in. So the first one, um, let's just move past this. Um, the first one is the belief that I must be approved of by others in order to be worthy. Of course, we all want that acceptance, we want to belong, that is the need that we have. We all have that fear of judgment, we all have that fear of rejection. And so when you have this belief that you have to be approved of by others in order to be worthy, you demand a lot of yourself. You feel like you have to perform well, you have to win approval from everybody, and if you don't, that means that you're unworthy. Let's move. So the things, the symptoms of this are like you're placing a lot of unrealistic expectations on yourself, you're overly concerned with what other people think, you feel like you have to achieve in order to be worthy, and you're very critical of yourself. And um, you also don't accept yourself for who you are. You feel like you have to do this, you have to do things in order for people to accept you. Um, let's move. And um, the emotional and behavioral consequences of this. So you'll have feelings of depression, feeling that you're not good enough, you're unable to express yourself or embrace your true self, you're always anxious, you have low confidence, you feel bad about yourself. When you get the small, you, you get any disapproval from people, you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough, you know. And I can say that this is something that I've also really, really struggled with over the years. Because, you know, when you have trauma as a child, it doesn't end there. It will follow you for many, many years, and healing takes a lot of work. So, like, let's say, for example, in my case, because I didn't have that love at home, and I constantly felt rejected, I constantly felt like um, I wasn't good enough, that definitely follows you into your adulthood. And you have to be very intentional. You have to work hard to get yourself out of that space of feeling like people don't like me, people will not approve of me unless, you know. Um, let's move on. So um, my advice, replace this um, irrational belief with this rational belief where you tell yourself that it is perfectly natural for life conditions to not be ideal um, or perfect, and it's, um, actually this is the, the wrong one. Um, we can just move to the next one, because this, is, this belongs to a, a different um, irrational belief. But the one for approval, what you need to tell yourself is that it is perfectly okay for some people to not like you sometimes. Not everybody needs to like you all the time because when you try to please everybody every time, that is how you get stuck because people will always demand different things of you. So get yourself out of that space where you feel like I need to be liked by everybody all the time. The second belief is the belief that other people must do the right thing 
and meet my expectations in order to be worthy. So you remember the first one was about yourself. Now this is an expectation that you're putting on other people. You feel like people have to do things exactly the way you expect them to do, to do them in order for, for them to, um, to be worthy. And this is where you struggle with the feeling of um, people are being unfair, people are disappointing me, um, and you have all these expectations of people that people are not able to meet, and that causes you suffering. So when I think about my own situation, you can actually move to the next one. When I think about my own situation, I of course felt that I had been let down by many people. I of course felt that life had been unfair in many ways. But the thing that I have learned over the years is that you cannot expect everybody to behave the way you expect them to behave. The only person that you have control over is yourself. And other people will make their own choices and you need to allow them to make their own choices and don't put your heart into, into it that, or oh, I'm expecting all these things from this person and this person is not uh, meeting my expectation because what that creates in you is a lot of bitterness. And that bitterness, you know, taking poison, waiting for the other person to die. It kills you more than it kills the other person. So um, don't assume that you know, you're the sole authority on what is right and what is wrong. Let other people, you know, if people are making their own choices and those choices are not in your favor, allow them to make their own choices. Let's move. Um, and this will save you those emotional and behavioral consequences of feeling angry, having a lot of impatience with other people, bitterness, resentment, um, forgiveness. I talked about forgiveness earlier. Um, forgiveness, when you forgive people, you do it more for yourself than you're doing it for the other person. Myself, I've had to forgive a lot of people. And um, some of them I've been able to forgive, some of them I haven't been able to forgive. But um, like I said, it's an ongoing journey. It's something that we constantly keep working on and hoping that one day we'll come to a place of peace where I'm at peace with myself, I'm at peace with the other person, and whatever it is that happened between us, I'm at peace with that, and I'm able to let them go. Um, so what, what I, I would advise in terms of um, being able to let go of this cause of our suffering is be yourself, uh, focus on the things that you can control, and the things that are out of your control, especially when it comes to other people's choices, other people's behavior, try as much as possible to let it go. Because the more that you struggle with changing someone, the more that you struggle with getting them to um, do things the way you want them to do, the more you suffer, more than they suffer. Um, let's move on. So um, replace that irrational belief with the rational belief that all people, including myself, are imperfect. They have value to offer, and they also have their own unique perspective about the world. That is how you get your peace. Let's move on. And finally, um, the belief that life must be easy without discomfort or inconvenience. Um, and the need here is that need for certainty. Like, I want life to be predictable. I want life to move in a straight line. I want to be comfortable. I want the world to be just. I want everybody to, you know, like everything to be fair. Um, and you fear adversity, you fear discomfort, you fear uncertainty. When things are not predictable, you don't know what's going on. That um, lack of comfort causes you suffering. So um, what you demand here is for the external conditions to be pleasant and favorable at all times. Um, and if they are not, if things are not going your way, you feel like life is awful, like everything is unbearable. You can't do this anymore. Um, so the symptoms of this are like you have unrealistic expectations about life and you want it to be perfect. You feel like um, bad things shouldn't happen. 
and then you also lack the ability to cope. So whenever you get any problems in life, you feel like it's unacceptable, you can't. And this is where, I mean, unfortunately, in our society today, we have a lot of cases of suicide, where life becomes hard, and as a person, the person decides that this is unbearable. I don't have the capacity to cope with whatever is happening to me right now. And um, unfortunately, some people end up taking their lives because of this. But um, when you tell yourself, you try and convince yourself that it is okay. Things are not always going to happen in a straight line. There are times when you'll be so broke, you don't have any money, you don't have anything. Or you might be in a very bad place in your relationship, whether it's your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your siblings, your relationship with your children, and you feel like it's too much, it's unbearable, I can't, you know. Try and calm yourself down, remind yourself that it is okay. And um, there will be times when things will not be moving in a straight line, things will not be going exactly as um, I plan or I want them to go, but you are able to cope, you can cope. And this takes me back to that verse that I told you I keep re 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 um, repeating to myself when I was in school. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that you need. I have everything that I need. And this is something that you can remind yourself. You have everything that you need. Whatever it is that you feel you don't have right now, even if it's the ability to cope with your situation, you do have it within yourself. Because God said you have everything that you need. And um, if you just hold on, if you just keep moving day by day, taking it a step at a time, if you need help, seek that help. At the end of the day, you will find that you do have everything that you need in order to get through that rough patch in your life. Um, let's move forward. Um, so, of course, those are the emotional and behavioral consequences of um, being in a place where you feel like life has to be comfortable or life has to move in a straight line. It will cause you a lot of um, self-pity, depression, having a lot of anxiety, and having a very low tolerance for frustrations. Um, let's move on. So you replace this with the belief that it is perfectly natural for life conditions to not be ideal or perfect. It's okay if situations do not exist the way I would prefer because I'm capable of finding solutions to problems and making changes that can bring me happiness and opportunity. Um, let's move on. Um, so I'm not going to go through this a lot, but it's a way, how do we question our irrational beliefs? When we feel like we are coming to a place where we have these irrational beliefs about ourselves, about others, about the world, how do we disrupt that or question them so that we can get ourselves in a more um, rational space? Let's move on. So this is just a template that I created that you can use for yourself. Um, on, on the first column, you can write um, the different things that you have beliefs about. And then also, so let's say for example, if one of your belief is that failure means, what, what does failure mean to you? When you fail, so for example, it could be like failure means I'm unworthy, you know? When I fail, it means I'm worthless, I don't know how to do my job, I don't know how to, you know, um, do life. So if that is what failure means to you, write that. Failure means I am unworthy. And then ask yourself, where is that belief coming from? Also ask yourself, is it true? And how do you know that it is true? Yeah, and you'll find that maybe that belief, when you're asking yourself, where did it come from? you will find that it came from somewhere, maybe in your childhood, where you are constantly being berated when you do something wrong or when you fail, you're told, oh, when you jinga, all that, you're unworthy. So that is the belief that you carry with you throughout your life. 
Um, and then ask yourself, when you, be, when you tell that to yourself, when you hold that, that belief, does it negatively impact your life? And if it, neg it, if it does negatively impact your life, what can you change it to? How can you change it so that it becomes a more, um, a more rational belief? And you can do that with any aspect of your life. Like, for example, uh, when you experience challenges, what does that mean? Um, what do you believe about other people? Do you believe that maybe other people don't like me, other people, uh, you know, whatever way you think about them, um, whatever situation in your life, maybe you're, you're single and you would like to get married or you'd like to get into a relationship, what does that mean to you? Does it, do you what do you tell yourself about the fact that you're single? Or what do you, if, you're in, if you're married and your marriage is failing, um, what does that mean? Do you tell yourself, because my marriage is failing, that says this negative thing about me? Is that true? Yeah? If it's negatively impacting you, how do you change that into a more rational belief? Let's move on. Uh, so this is a quote. Um, it's a quote that I really like, and I've also related it to a Bible verse that... Um, I also really like, if you don't go after what you want, you'll never have it. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you don't step forward, you'll always be in the same place. That's a quote by Nora Roberts. And it goes very well with the Bible verse from Luke chapter 11, verse 9 to 10. Um, the one about um, ask and you shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's a song that we used to sing about that. I, I, if you notice, like I really, when a lot of my, my um, foundation in my spiritual life is from the time when I was in high school especially. The songs that we used to sing, like this one for example, we had a song where we would sing about, you know, um, um, ask and it shall be, yeah, my voice, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And that is one of my life mantras, you know, you have to go for whatever you need or else you're going to be stuck in the same place, talking about how unfair other people are, how unfair life is, and you don't move forward because you have not taken, um, the opportunity to put yourself out there and ask, um, you know, ask for what you need. Whether you're asking people, whether you're asking God, whether you're asking it of yourself, because sometimes you also need to ask yourself, you know, this is what I need. And ask your body to cooperate with you and get you what you need. Like, for example, I need to be healthier. I'm getting some lifestyle diseases right now and I know that these diseases, I'm getting them because of my lifestyle, yeah? I know I'm getting them because I don't eat, I don't eat healthy. I know I'm getting them because I don't exercise. Sit down with yourself and tell your body, I need to, this is what we need. We need to get healthy. And what that means is that we will be uncomfortable sometimes. We will wake up, we will go and exercise. We will deny ourselves that KFC so that we can. Uh, go home and, and cook ugali and skumawiki, you know. Um, so some of those things you'll be asking them of yourself. Some of them you'll be asking them of God. Some of them you'll be asking them of the world. Um, but you really do need to knock on doors. You need to seek what you need um, so that you can find you can find them. I'm going to leave this part out because I want to be sensitive about time. But in general, what it is, is just like um, finding evidence for whatever it is that you want to believe about yourself and disproving the evidence that you think you have about those irrational beliefs you might have about yourself. So thank you all very much. I'm going to stop there and really appreciate you once again for your time. Um, I hope that you have been blessed. Thank you.